as we continue to look at the lives of people in the word of God, we not only find people with great glorious successes, but the Bible speaks of them as they were in their humanness, in their mistakes, and that is what speaks to us. The Bible speaks, tells us that we have a great salvation, but it warns us of, of how careful we should be. It warns us against neglecting and being careless and not taking seriously God's calling. Uh, Paul writes uh, in this, one of his letters that work out your salvation with fear and trembling. We have a responsibility. God has given us the salvation. We have received the salvation in our life, but we have to work it out with fear and trembling. We cannot be careless or negligent about it. Of course, we, it's not by our works that we are saved, but what Paul is meaning is that we have to be responsible. We have to guard uh, the salvation and guard our, our life before God. And of course, in the next part of the verse, Paul says, it is God who works in you, giving you both the will uh, to do uh, what he wants you to do. It is God who works in us, but we have to cooperate with God and allow him to shape our lives. In Proverbs 4.23, um, the writer says, above all, all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Another translation says, keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. The writer to the book of Proverbs is giving the sound advice. Keep your heart, guard your heart, keep it with all vigilance. Do not let it go astray, for from it flows the springs of life. Your, your life and all that you are manifested in your life will flow from what is in our heart. Samson, the tragedy of a person who, who neglected God's calling and God's uh, anoint, anointing on his life. It is not a, a sudden, you know, it was not a sudden fall, but it was a gradual fall. It was a neglect, little by little. And the danger of the life of a person who neglects or who doesn't take the call of God seriously in his or her life. We read the, we saw the passage that was read to us. The children of Israel, after settling in the promised land, they, God had warned them not to mix with the surrounding nations or adopt their culture, their gods, and also not to take, uh, not to marry, intermarry, between them because then they would be drawn away from the worship of Jehovah. But the children of Israel, again in and again, it was cycles of doing evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord would then allow one of their surrounding nations to rule over them, to defeat them, to conquer them and rule over them. And then when they were in utter misery, they would cry to the Lord and the Lord would send a deliverer. So the Lord delivered Israel into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. For 40 years, the Philistines impoverished the Israelites and they ruled over them. And it was in that, this period that God sent uh, the angel to tell Manoah and his wife that uh, they will have a son and that a wife, her, Manoah's wife herself should be consecrated even when she is con conceiving Samson in her womb. So her wife itself, his wife herself should not uh, drink any wine or strong drink 
not eat anything unclean. And she herself has to be consecrated to the Lord. And then when the child is born, he will be a Nazarite from his birth. Nazarite dedicated to God from the womb. And that he would deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. We read that Manoah was sincerely interested in bringing up his, this child in the ways of the Lord so that he could, he could fulfill the purpose which God had anointed for him. Because Manoah prayed, Oh my Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come to us again and teach us what we shall do for the child who will be born. So Manoah was really interested in wanting to bring up this child in the way that God wanted him, them to do. Samson could not have blamed his parents saying, they did not teach me. They did not tell me about my calling. No, Manoah and his wife were si sincerely interested in bringing up this child to fulfill God's purpose for his life. What was this Nazarite vow? Those who had taken the Nazarite vow, they were a class of individuals specially devoted to God. That means, it means someone consecrated, devoted and separated for God. There were two types of Nazarite vows. One was for a specific, specific period of time. They took a vow uh, to be a, a Nazarite vow for a certain pe period of time. And the other type was a lifelong vow. For example, Sam Samson was to be a lifelong, till the day of his death, he is to be a Nazarite consecrated to God. Others were Samuel and John the Baptist, as we know, was a Nazarite. And what did this vow con consist of? It consisted of abstinence from wine, growth of hair, and avoidance of contact with the dead. They were, they were to be set apart. They would not, should not touch any wine or strong fermented drink. The hair, they would not allow a razor to come on their hair, and they would avoid contact with the dead. In other words, the significance was that they would be consecrated only to the Lord right from the time of, of their birth. And that was the Nazarite vow. And the angel told Manoah and his wife that Samson was to be a Nazarite till the day of his death. So we read, the woman bore a son and called his name Samson. And the child grew and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move upon him at Mahanel Dan. In other words, what this means, the Spirit of the Lord began to move upon him, that the Spirit of the Lord was pushing Samuel towards doing the work that God wanted him to do. So God was working in Samson's life as he grew up to do the work that God wanted him to do. But Sadly, we see that Samson did not take his calling very seriously. As he grew up and there was a downward slide, a gradual slide, step by step. And as we see, many of those, many of those who, fall, who have fallen in their Christian life, if, you look, if we look at our own failures, it is not a sudden failure which happened one day. It is a gradual downward slide. The first sliding down was seeking a Philistine wife. Seeking a Philistine wife. We read, Samson went down to Timna and saw a woman in Tim Timna of the daughters of, <coughs> excuse me, daughters of the Philistines. So he went up and told his father and mother, saying, I have seen a woman in Timna of the daughters of, of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me as a wife. 
is there no woman um, among the daughters of your brethren that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philist Philistines? His father asked him. But Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she pleases me well. Get her for me, for she pleases me well. <coughs> In other words, get her for me. She is right in my eyes. She is right in my eyes. It reveals his self-centered attitude, not seeking God's will, but, but to please himself. Then we read this, um, this verse, but his father and mother did not know that it was of the Lord that he was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines. It's a little puzzling, this verse, that God was actually bringing Sam Samson to do this, uh, to take the, to do this marriage. But I believe God's word will not contradict itself. This does not justify Samson's action. God had expressly forbidden Israelites from intermarrying with the surrounding nations. We read before they entered and after they entered the promised land, Joshua and others, God repeatedly said, you should not mix with them. You should not intermarry with them. You should not adapt their customs. So does this mean that God approved of Samson's action? It does not mean that God approved of Samson's action, but I believe it just means that God would use Samson's defiant wish as a way of defeating the Philistines. God can use our mistakes, our dis disobedience, and, and many times our defiance of his wishes, but God can use it to bring about his purposes. He is not limited if we disobey. It just does not mean that God approved of Samson's action. The downward slide number two, contact with the dead lion, eating honey from the carcass and breaking the Nazarite wall. We read Samson is now going with his parents to see this woman and to fix up the marriage. And as they walked through the vineyards, a young lion came roaring against them. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And he tore the lion apart. Then he went down and talked with the woman and she pleased Samson well. After some time, when he returned to get her, he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. A swarm of bees and honey were in the carcass of the lion. He took some of it in his hands and went along eating. When he came to his father and mother, he gave some to, to them. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion that he was really breaking the Nazarite wall. What a tragedy. Samson encountered the lion, which he tore apart. And then when they uh, went back to, you know, to fix the marriage, he found that there was a, a swarm of bees in that carcass and there, there was honey. Obviously, his parents were not walking with him at this time. Samson, the spirit of the Lord must have convinced, convicted him, but he would have thought, what is it? After all, it's a little bit of honey. I have walked in the hot sun for so long and I'm hungry and weary. A little bit of honey doesn't matter where it is from. It will surely refresh me. He took, it is, we read, he took some of it in his hands and went along eating and he gave it to his parents, but he knew he should not tell them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass. 
because that was breaking the Nazarite vow. He knew that that was wrong, but he probably ex excused himself. And he thought, anyway, nobody has seen. My parents are not with me. No one will know about it. It was secret sins, but God knew. And, and that disobedience continued the downward slide of Samson in his life. The downward slide number four, uh, probable contact with wine, probable contact with wine. Why do we say that? We, re we read that Samson gave a feast there for seven days for young men used to do so. It was the custom of young men who were getting married to give a feast for seven days. And the word translated as a feast or banquet, it denote, denotes a banquet with considerable drinking. We cannot imagine a wedding feast in that secu secular world village without any wine. And this word signifying feast den denotes a feast with considerable drinking. Is it possible that Samson would have abstained throughout the seven days without touching the wine? even though everybody would have persuaded him, it is possible that Samson would have given in to this temptation also because he would have thought, what is that? A little wine, after all, we are living in this world. We have to follow the customs of the world. Then we know what happened. Samson posed a riddle they could not answer. His wife persuaded him to tell her the answer. And Samson had to, according to the deal, Samson had to give 30 garments to the Philistine men. And he went and killed 30 Philistine men and took their garments to pay to these men. And burning with anger, he went down to his father's house. He was angry, furious, mad, but he, did not realize that he had brought this down on himself. Himself, he has brought this. And we read, he went back to his house and Samson's wife was given to another man. What a complication. After a while, Samson visited his wife and he found that she had been given to his companion. And Samson was again really angry he took revenge by setting their grain fields and vineyards on fire. And the Philistines, when they knew that it was Samson who did this, they came and burned his wife and father to death. Then when Samson heard about it, he wanted to, he, he wanted to take revenge. The Philistines came against him for doing this, for burning their crops. But we read that, that the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. He found a fresh jawbone of a donkey. He reached out his hand and took it and killed a thousand men with it. He had no sword or spear. He had no club or weapon. He found a fresh jawbone of a donkey. And with that, he killed thousand of the Philistines. After Samson had accomplished this feat, what was his victory cry? What was his cry of victory? We read, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps. With the jawbone of a donkey, I have slain a thousand men. His cry of victory is, we just with the jawbone of a donkey, I have slain, I have slain a thousand men. In other words, his inner attitude is exposed. I have made donkeys of, de of them. I have slain a thousand men. There is no mention of God's help in this. There's no acknowledgement of the Lord in his victory. He says, with the jawbone of a donkey, 
that is without any sword or spear or proper weapon, I have slain. Let us compare this with the song of Moses after the deliverance at the Red Sea from the Egyptian army. Moses sang the song of praise. I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song and he has become my salvation. Moses never once mentioned that I have delivered the Israelites out of Egypt. He, say, say he acknowledges God. He gives God all the glory. I will glorify the Lord because it's he who have, has triumphed. It is not me, but it is he who has triumphed gloriously. <coughs> Excuse me. And the Lord is my strength and song and my salvation. There is no such acknowledgement in Samson's cry of victory. And God had to remind Samson of his frailty. God had to tell Samson, Samson, you boast so much of your strength. You do not realize that you are a frail person. We read that Samson became very thirsty. <coughs> and he cried out to the Lord and said, you have given this great deliverance by the hand of your servant. Now shall I die of thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised. He knew they were uncircumcised people, but he had no problem in getting involved with the Philistines. So Samson there was very thirsty even unto death, and there was no water there. And then he cries out to the Lord, Lord, you have given this victory. Now save me from their hand. Give me water that I do not die of thirst. And we read, God mercifully heard his prayer. God split the hollow place and water came out and he drank and his spirit returned and he revived. God had to remind Samson that he was nothing, a frail, only a frail person. And all his strength was from the Lord. In Samson's life, the tragic tragedy which we see is only in two places he cries out to the Lord. Only in two places, he, on two occasions, he pr prays to the Lord. And both were when he was desperate. Both when he was desperate. One was, one was when he was going to die of thirst and the other was when he was defeated, when he was caught by the, pris, the Philistines and his eyes were put out and he prays a desperate prayer to God. So in two places, it shows the character and the faith of Samson. Further playing with sin, he went to a prostitute in Gaza and we read that the Philistines surrounded the place and waited for him the whole night. But Samson came out in the middle of the night. He lifted the doors and the posts of the gate and ca carried it to the top of the hill. Samson again thinks that he can use his strength in whatever way he likes. He thought he could always play with sin and get away with it. But finally, as, as the great preachers say, Beware, O oh man, your sin will find you out. Your sin will find you out. You will not always get away. There was a further slide and fall. The involvement with Delilah, a Philistine woman, a deceitful woman who pretended that she loved Samson, but she really brought about his downfall. Involvement with Delilah. And Samson was foolish enough to tr trust her. Afterward, it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, entice him and find out where his great strength lies. And every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. We know what happened 
we we the the woman um, tries to, to get samson to reveal his secret she there were three occasions in which she tried and could not get his secret she said samson said bind me with fresh bow strings and i will be weak like anyone and the woman while after putting samson to sleep brought that and tied himself tied had him tied with these strings but and then he said samson the philistines are upon you and samson woke up and just snapped these seven bow strings the second time she said samson you don't really love me you are you are fool making a fool of me then he says tell me your secret he says bind me with new ropes that has not been used and the woman did so and again the same thing is repeated and samson wakes up from his sleep and snaps the rope the woman goes on pestering samson how can you say you love me when you are not sharing your secret samson don't you realize that she is really not loving uh, really not truly loving you she wants to prof profit from you but then the third time samson says weave the seven locks of my head into the web of the loom into the loom or spinning loom weave the seven locks of my head you have to look at it very carefully all this while he he was playing with bow strings and ropes now he is coming closer to the secret of his strength he is coming close to his hair god had said it should not be uh, shaved is now although he doesn't tell the secret but obviously his resistance is wearing down as we play with sin the resistance wears down samson said okay i can do this i can tell a, a half truth but still i will not she will not be able to do to capture me so they she did that but then again again when the philistines came samson woke up and pulled his hair out of the loom it was coming closer to his secret and his resistance was wearing down <coughs> finally the woman said to him how can you say i love you when your heart is not with me and it came to pass when she pestered him daily and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death that he told her all his heart he told her revealed to her the full secret no razor has ever come upon my head for i have been a nazarite to god from my mother's womb i have been dedicated to my god from my mo mother's womb and part of that wow is that no razor will be will touch my hair if i am shaven then my strength will leave me and i shall become weak and be like any other man the resistance was completely worn out and the secret was revealed and we read she lulled him to sleep and called for a man and had had him shave off the seven locks of his head and she says the philistines are upon you samson so he awoke from his sleep and he thought to himself i will go out as before and shake myself free but he did not know that the lord had departed from him the sad part of it was samson had become so insensitive towards god and towards god's voice he revealed his secret his hair was shaved but he thought like before i can just get you know win over them i can just defeat them i can just shake them away but sad part he did not know that the lord had departed from him and that is the sad part when we play with sin and when we do not know that god's mercy has been taken away from us and we continue in sin thinking that that we will we will escape like before he did not know 
that the Lord had departed from him. The sad plight of a man of God, the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters and he became a grinder in prison. However, the hair of his head began to grow again. The Philistines gathered to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God. Our God has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. So the Philistines are celebrating and honoring their God, thinking that Dagon has delivered Samson. And then we know the story while Samson was um, in that stadi stadium, uh, blind, and Philistines were all rejoicing and mocking him. Samson prays again the second recorded prayer, and that too in this desperate situation. O oh Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O oh God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. Praise a desperate prayer. Oh Lord, Lord, I know I have forsaken you. I know I have not taken you ser seriously in my life. I know I have played with sin. But Lord, have mercy on me. Remember me just this once, I pray. Strengthen me just once that I may take vengeance on the Philistines. And we know what happened. Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple and he pushed with all his might, let me die with the Philistines. He pushed with all his might and the temple fell on the lords and all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. And his bro brothers and all his father's household came down and took him and buried him in the tomb of his father, Manoah. He had judged Israel 20 years. What a sad result of a life that was meant to be dedicated and consecrated to God, that a life that could have been very different had he taken his calling seriously. What are the lessons that we can learn from Samson's life? Firstly, Samson did not take his calling as a Nazarite very seriously. He did not live a holy, separated life for God, which he was meant to be. He did what pleased his senses. He had little self-control. He did not take his calling seriously. Samson played with sin. A first a Philistine wife disobeying the command of the Lord, then with harlot in Gaza, and finally with this Philistine woman, Elilah. Samson was involved in secret sins. He thought nobody will know. It will not happen, affect me at all. He ate honey from the lion's carcass, which he was not meant to do as, as a Nazarite. He thought no one knew, but he pulled him further downwards. Samson did not acknowledge that his strength came from God. It was no, not from his own self. After he had killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey, he said, I have made don donkeys of them with merely a jawbone without even any weapons. There are only two record prayers of Samson and they were both in desperate situations to save his own self. Samson's life is characterized by episodic exploits of great str strength, but nothing to show the character of God. In 1 Peter chapter 2, 9, we, are set, we, are, we read that Peter says, you have been chosen a royal priesthood, you are chosen, you are chosen to be holy. Why? That you may proclaim 
the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are called to show the glory of God who has called, called you. You are not called to show your greatness, but you are called to sh show the greatness of the Lord who has brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And as we have said, uh, as, we, as we saw in the beginning, Proverbs, the writer says, keep your hearts with all di diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. So these are all written that we may get, that we may learn that we may we may take seriously the warnings from the life of people in the Old Test in the past. And the writer to the Hebrews says, we must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. The writer is using the word drift away. We know drifting is a slow process. It's not a sudden uh, going disobedience. It's a slow process. If you know uh, some of us who have had the opportunity to live by rivers in Kerala, we had a boat which was tied to, the, to a tree on the, on the uh, river bank. But at night, the tie rope came loose. And in the morning, it was, the rope boat was far away. It was not a sudden movement. It was a slow carrying away by the crowd. And we must pay more careful attention so that we do not drift away. But the writer to the Hebrews has, has an encouragement even after giving all this warning. He says, but brothers, we are confident of better things concerning you. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the, the promises. The writer to the Hebrews says, even though we have given all these warnings, brothers, and sisters, we are confident of better things in your life. And they, we want you, that you do not become sluggish, slow, lazy, drifting. You do not become sluggish, imitate those, learn from those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And we have this great verse which Paul tells Timothy, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Paul says, I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to keep me faithful. I have committed my life to him. I have committed my love, my strength, everything to him. And I am confident that he will keep me until the day of his coming. And that is, brothers and sisters, that is our assurance that it is the Lord who will keep us. Nevertheless, we have to be careful that we do not treat, take our commitment, uh, our Christian life uh, carelessly, that we do not drift away, but that we take all, all efforts to follow him sincerely, to follow the Lord and to obey him in our lives. May God help us and teach us from his word through the life of Samson. Thank you. Shall we just pray? Lord, we thank you for the great lessons that you teach us from the life of your servants in the past. And we thank you for your mercy, Lord, that even when we fail, your grace will uphold us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that in spite of all of Samson's failures, yet he finds a place in the book of Hebrews among the heroes of faith. Lord, we trust in you. We lay our lives before you. Keep us in your mercy, embrace us, and keep us true and faithful till the end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.